it's always a challenge to say to someone, do you remember that film from years ago? Well, if you've already got the DVD and the Blu-ray and the 4K and this, that, and the other, now go and buy this big, heavy book. Because people think, well, what's going to be in that that I haven't seen? It's like, ah, we'll pay for it. There's no refunds. Um, and, And find out. I got to say, I loved the book. Uh, I finished it yesterday. It is such a great chronicling of this journey. Um, and clearly you're a fan of the movie, uh, as, as you make mention throughout. Where where did the fandom for this film first come about for you? I think for me, it was a case of there was a, only a, a certain amount of films that were kicking around as VHS tapes in the 80s. And uh, when network television in the UK was quite limited, what it could show and what it would show. And so the films you'd want to see like Evil Dead or Texas Chainsaw Massacre wouldn't be shown on, on mainstream television. So this was part, The Wicker Man was part of that. It was part of films that weren't often shown. And of course, it had an X certificate and it had quite the reputation for being, you know, quite the horror film. But of course, we look at it now and actually there's, there's no real horror. There's no there's no graphic anything you know there's no bad language there's no bad behavior really there's a bit of naughtiness you could say at the end um and and of course it shocked people at the time because it was a policeman people had the police on a pedestal but for me i was always a big fan of doctor who and this felt like it could be a doctor who style adventure um, where the doctor goes somewhere and uh the doctor being of course the policeman and so on um, and, and there's a female assistant, which would be Willow in the pub. I know it's a bit of a stretch for some people when I say that, but um, but why not? You know, but the, the Wicker Man is a funny thing. It kind of grows a bit like moss, and if you don't keep an eye on it, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And it has no big stars. No one went on to do anything. If we think of Evil Dead, Sam Raimi and everyone else, they went on to do great big things, and that's kind of like an origin story. This isn't an origin story. The professional people who work behind the scenes, this was the finish of things for them. You know, they thought it was it would get things started. It didn't. If anything, it it kind of put their careers to bed um, politely. And and the stars who did go on to do other projects didn't reference this as, oh, I just worked on the Wicker Man. They're like, what? The Wicker what? You know, don't don't shout about that. Isn't that the film that they couldn't give away at the time? Yeah, that's it. I just worked on that. Well, as I say, don't don't mention that. So we think about cult films that are successful, that were unsuccessful when they first came out. The Wicker Man kind of sidesteps all of those kind of tropes of usual cult films. And yet here we are, 4K restoration, big expensive book. A, 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 a Studio Canal have produced something as big as a house brick, which has all bits and bobs in it. Three versions of the film, essays, one which I wrote, and uh, postcards and everything else. So it's getting the right royal restoration treatment if you think of 1973 there are a few films from that era maybe the exorcist and the golden voyage of sinbad um that kind of deserve a big book and a restoration and so on but um the poor old wicker man who got kicked around on his first release as you'll have found out from reading reading the book yes i knew it had had a troubled history but didn't realize the extent of it until this book which is really quite it was quite fascinating to learn about um and so one thing that I love about this book in comparison to a lot of other oral history books is that it's written by a, a filmmaker uh, in comparison to just a, a historian or a fan. And so I'm curious how you balanced your approach uh, in writing this book coming from, you know, being a filmmaker as much as being a fan of the film. For me, because I'm a documentary filmmaker, I want to line up all of the facts and line up all of the uh, suspects, if we will. So it's a bit like a cold case and the murder hasn't really been solved. So who was there? What did they know? And what have they said? Because, you know, you have one interview here saying one thing, one interview here saying something else. And as you know, Christopher Lee went around saying lots about the film over the years, which I was always suspicious of knowing Back in the day when I was at film school and and when this film was being made, I was at film school in in the late 80s, but the worst worst thing a producer could be accused of, it's not like today, there's all sorts of producer can be accused of, but at the time, the worst thing you could say about a producer was he destroyed camera negative. That would finish you. You know, if that was true and it was shown that you worked on a picture and whether accidentally or deliberately is even worse... You know, you might have done a murder, but you've actually destroyed camera negative. Um, So I always was suspicious of Lee's 
um, assertions that people went out of their way to destroy the film. And I'm like, these are people you're talking about who went on to make Blade Runner and The Deer Hunter and had already made The Italian Job. These aren't Michael Dealey. He's not going to be going out of his way to destroy the film because it's his company who put most of the money up. It's like building a house and you don't like the windows, so you decide to burn it down. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Um, so over the years, with many of the books I've written, different people, often performers, will, will create, a, as it were, almost a stand-up routine where they go and tell these stories, which regale audiences and have people fascinated, um, but weren't true. So I thought, oh, right, well, I'm going to be unpopular here and put my hand up and say, actually, I don't think that's true. And try and show in a book with verification why that isn't true so there are lots of people around from the wicker man as you'll have read uh, who are still with us and i had access to all of the paperwork all of the financial legal and contractual paperwork and schedules and details on the on the dailies what you'd call or we'd call the rushes so the footage that went to and fro every day so there really was no stone left unturned in that sense and and there was a bigger story to be told people often say with the books are right that you know the film's okay but actually the story of the making of the film is a real hair curler and you think what as you're turning the pages you can't quite believe what you're reading um and that was the case of the wicker man it's it's a relatively modestly budgeted film and yet um here we are talking about it 50 years later you mentioned you know calling people out on some of the assertions they've made over the years uh i'm curious how you you know how you approach that in an interview you're you're there trying to bond with the person enough that they want to talk to you in the first place and then you have to you know deal with some of the more serious subject matter that you cover in this book so how do you go about approaching that in an interview you have to be quite careful and diplomatic and of course what you can't say to somebody is i think this is untrue and you deliberately told an untruth um it's it's really a case of going back to them and saying look i've spoken to other people they remember it differently what do you think do you think maybe there's a possibility that things have been remembered differently um when uh, queen elizabeth not long before she died when she talked about the disputes in her family and there was all this chat on on the telly about um um harry and and megan and so on and the queen said you know recollections differ and you know so i offered people the chance to say that recollection recollections differed and whether it's speaking to Brit Eklund or to the producer, uh, Peter Snell, or Mike Dealey and Barry Spikings, who ran British Lion, um, there was an opportunity there to kind of get the story straight. And people were pleased I was writing a book. So the approach isn't like a um, an aggressive detective who's only got 48 hours to solve the case. You know, people know that it's a loving tribute to the film. It's being reissued. The film's getting this great book. But let's come on. Let, let, let's try and get the story straight because this is will probably be the first and last time in book form that the official story of the film can be told. And so people know me from other books and sometimes from my film work as well. So they think, oh, okay, maybe it's a cathartic thing. I can I can tell John Walsh then that maybe I over egg the pudding. Happened on on Flash Gordon there up up the top there. Um some of the cast had had, had behaved uh, well one of the cast let's be honest had behaved not ideally um and 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 put really the film at risk and, and and possible sequels at risk and so on um it's tricky though because film people as i know um can be <laughs> professional grudge bearers <laughs> um so you know when you it's not necessarily an old wound for them it's a it's a it's a new scab that you're picking at and so you have to be careful because you want the access and you want the interview um but people feel that ah if everyone else has spoken to you i i want to tell you what i think and i was there um and, and and people who haven't spoken before so people think of the cast and the director but of course the people who haven't spoken are sometimes the art director he'd be called the production designer today i spoke to him at, at considerable length and he lent me all those images you saw in there from uh, seamus uh, flannery uh, many of them hadn't been published before and he was quite outspoken about the film the shoots his involvement his lack of credits in terms of um long-term um, recognition for what he did in creating the image and, and the feel of the film and Harry Waxman who who rarely even gets talked about in this country who was a great director of photography who really created that sort of ambient look that the film has as well um, so it's a case of trying to wrestle away the the truth as was and to bring it into the light and show people actually it was a terrible lie including the book being options you know the director 
Robin Hardy, the screenwriter, Anthony Schaefer, who was an, a, an immensely talented and, and wonderful man, um, and Christopher Lee, between the three of them, they tried to imply that they optioned a book called Ritual, um, but in fact, uh, um, they spent thousands optioning it. But in fact, they did something completely different to Ritual, and this isn't anything like that. And I always thought, gosh, that's another injustice. Why are they getting away with this? Um, because no one's really challenging it. And I mean, fans aren't going to take them to court over it. They like hearing the stories. But luckily, the author of the ritual is is still alive, David Pinner. I got to know him very well. And I said to him, look, you know, it's it's my view and, and your view that you're not fully credited. But how is it best to put this on the page without it looking like, you know, I've got a grudge or you've got an agenda? So he put me in touch with a leading academic, Dr. David Anwin Jones. And I said to him, look, what, what do you think? This is what I think. What do you think? And he was a leading academic, and he is a leading academic in, in folk horror. And uh, he, he contributed extensively to the book to help build my case. So if we were going to court and you were the judge, I'd need to be able to say, look, this is my evidence. I want to overturn the previous verdict. Um, so it's a bit of an obsessive way of working, but um, it's how I work for TV, and it isn't any different for the books. And so it's great that people get that sense of um, something new has been discovered. Well, it's a great approach because, yes, there's so much that I feel was unearthed in this book that uh, I, I can't wait for people to get to learn about. Uh, and on that note, what was what would you say was one of the more surprising tidbits that maybe you didn't already know prior to going into the book that you learned? The kind of chaotic nature of the shoots. I mean, there was there was lots of little stories, including one where um, one of the actors, um, uh, what was it, uh, Leslie McKay, she was uh, sent down to London um, with the rushes, with the actual dailies footage on the train um, to give them into the laboratories for them to be developed. And it's kind of like, wow, that would never happen. Um, even a few years later in the 80s, you'd never do something like that. You'd have someone either from the laboratory come to you or you'd have a special courier bike and so on. And so they they were kind of... Um, um, I wouldn't say they they were they were um, careless, but there was a there was a lot of opportunities for things to go wrong here, and it didn't. Health and safety just absolutely didn't exist. You know the shots we have that have never been published before of the stuntman and how he was laying out his um, uh, mattress underneath what would have been the burning wicker man. So they set it on fire with loads of petrol. It went <laughs> like that. The wicker the uh, stuntman's inside. He has to jump. Um, to save his life onto onto mattresses, that would never happen now. You know, the the the, the working processes, health and safety. Um, oh, this this I should be telling you all this because now everyone's going to think, oh, I won't read his bloody book. But uh, <laughs> Diana Salento, who played Miss Rose, uh, she was married to a very very famous man at the time. She was married to uh, Mr. James Bond himself, Sean Connery, and uh, she was having an affair with Anthony Schaefer on the set. He'd cast her and um, helped cast her as Miss Rose, the school teacher. And uh, she brought along her son, Jason Connery, who, who later appeared as Robin of Sherwood on, on English television and some movies. And they later married. Uh, she revealed after the film that she is, in fact, a white witch. And so this kind of lends sort of some of the credence, or if you like, the conspiracy theory around how people have been drawn in to the Wicker Man. Um, and and people have said that about me as well. I've I was chosen to write this book by the Wicker Man, um, so I, I, I didn't think too much of that to start with. But then lots of people kept saying it to me. You're the ideal person for this. You've probably been chosen by the Wicker Man. I was like, oh, thank you very much. Do I get a bigger fee? Um, no, apparently not. Um, so finding out she was a white witch kind of lends a, a sense of eeriness to the idea that the Wicker Man in the background is creating his own image and sustaining himself and reimagining himself like a myth should every kind of decade. And now he's at his height of his powers. The cost of the 4K restoration would be close to the cost of what the film actually cost to make in 1973. So who would have thought all these years later, this film that people wouldn't go to see is now being charged for in a very expensive box set and a book it's very crazy to think. And uh, like you say, there there may be some mythical uh, forces driving it forward. But I mean, you know, I still love the movie. I rewatched it the other night and uh, I'm perfectly OK if that's the case. <laughs> um, now, 
uh, you, you've you've talked about you know a lot of the people that you you talked to for this book, actors, people behind the scenes. Um, I'm curious who you felt was the most important person to go to first. Obviously, Robin's not around anymore. Christopher is unfortunately no longer around. So, who did you feel was the most important person to go to first? Well, for me, the person who who kind of had who was the kind of soul of this was was the film's uh, producer Peter Snell, and so um, I worked closely with Peter, finding out really what happened and 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 the kind of the temperature on set. And I would check things with him as well. So if if I thought that someone said something a bit outrageous, I'd I'd, I'd always run it past Peter to get a sense of he was the witness, if you will, to to all of this. Um, this and more because he was involved at British Lion. You know, he was in charge at the time when the film was commissioned and had he not been, the film wouldn't have been commissioned. Um, and I asked that of the the owner, the then owners of British Lion who took it over during the shoot of The Wicker Man, Barry Spikins and, and Sir Michael Dealey, who went on to have glittering Hollywood careers. I mean, uh, Barry Spikings went on to make all sorts of films um, with Castle Rock Entertainment when Harry met Sally in Misery and so on. So they're, they're men of great standing. They both still don't like The Wicker Man. And I said, if you had a chance to go back now, what would you do? They said, no, we wouldn't make it. We wouldn't make it. Um, so um, for me, it was Peter Snell, because Peter was involved in a practical sense, from commissioning the film to being the day-to-day -day producer and he was, he's the last of the trio. It was Schaefer, Hardy and Snell that really made this film work. Um, but it was Peter's view and one that increasingly other people were conveying to me. It was made despite Robin Hardy's input, not because of it. And um, so the film maybe could have been even better had it not had Robin Hardy as the director, which seems like a harsh kind of conclusion, but it's not one that I brought to the table. It was one that was was brought to me and then I, I served it up as uh, as part of the meal in the book. Um, so it's kind of controversial, you know, for fans of this film who've held on to years to the mythology of what happened to it and, and why it was treated the way it was. And many people thought it was treated that way because it tapped into something um, that I guess the authorities didn't want you to be tapped into. No, it's not that. Um, it was an unsuccessful film and unsuccessful films tend to get thrown around the place a bit. Um, so the, the fact that it became more successful as it found its hole again lends to the mythology of, ah, well, it's the Wicker Man who's put himself back together. Um, but there were lots of people involved. You know, people who do like the film are really heavily invested in it and will watch it regularly and will enjoy the... Uh, the reissues and the new footage. But um, those who don't like it, you you can never convince them. Get them in a headlock. It could be an 8K version. They're not going to like it. I definitely uh, am excited to see the remaster myself. Uh, I mean, I think it's a film that still looks beautiful to this day for the, its era. But yeah, no, I, I think it's going to be really exciting to see those new um, layers to it. Um, now, given that this is a book that chronicles the movie's legacy, um, part of me was curious to see if you explored the remake at all in the book, which you don't. Uh, and I'm curious if that was an intentional thing or if that was just because there was not enough space in the book um, or if it was even in your mind at all uh, when you were going about this process. So what you've got, Ron, you've got the remake film with Nicolas Cage, um, but you've got the sequel film, The Wicker Tree, that yes. Robin Hardy did in, in, in 2011 with Peter Snell which Peter said he regretted doing. Um, and then there was The Wicker Man 2 that was written by Anthony Schaefer as well. Mm -hmm. um, and even um, David Pinner made a sequel to his book, Ritual. Um, so there was lots of different versions of what could and would have happened next. Because this is licensed by Studio Canal, I had access to all of what they owned for this title. Mm -hmm. They didn't own the other titles, but it wouldn't have been something I'd have been too interested in going into. Um, the Wicker Tree is the natural sequel because it has um the some of the production team from wicker man and robin hardy is directing again um so when people say to me remake or the follow-up i always think wicker tree whereas the nick cage film which is fine you know as a, as a standalone film it's fine like a lot of films from that era um but it, it doesn't capture anywhere near the magic of of the wicker man and we think of some of the big animated feature films that have had live action versions done which you know are really spectacular and have great fx and so on but they seem soulless. And I think this is always a difficulty if you're remaking something 
um, and revisiting it. People are hardwired. I was speaking to somebody the other day about Superman 2, and I'm hardwired into the theatrical version. And I love the Richard Donner version that came out only a few years ago, which is brilliant too. But the theatrical one from 1982 has all the Paris stuff in it. And you remember as a kid seeing that being very excited. So it's very difficult, if not impossible, to remake something that's so beloved. Um, I can't think of a remake. Um, probably people are screaming at us now, Grant, say, yes, it is a remake. But what remake or... I mean, sequels have been better. Look, you've got Star Trek 2, people think is better than Star Trek motion picture i love motion picture godfather 2 people hold up empire strikes back um and cheekily i i say sting 2 and cocoon the return um people are screaming they're switching off now probably um but it's 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 down to studios trying to revitalize something that people recognize so it's like political candidates you know you spend half your money on getting name recognition if people know what you stand for whereas if you're doing part two or part three of something someone's seen before or just the remake it was a remake of clash of the titans which um i'm a trustee of the ray harryhausen foundation so i'm very much involved in all of the original harryhausen films and, and the creatures and so on but people i never meet anyone who says they like the sequel to clash of the titans um and yet it, it did really good business and it was very successful so i think people feel exploited when a film that they so beloved as a youngster is suddenly being churned up again with a different actor playing the leading role and as you would have read from my book i have an exclusive interview with who was the original intended actor to play um the part that edward would so successfully made his own um, on the island. And that's great fun. I love doing that sort of thing, who it should have been, who it could have been. Um, that's more important to me than, than following down the sequel road. We could have gone there with the sequels and with the remakes and that. But some of the fans said to me, whatever you do, don't even mention the Nick Cage remake and don't show stuff. And I was kind of thinking, oh yeah, that was never on my, that's never on my to-do list. I'm not going to find pages for that. when I've got some amazing, amazing photography from Studio Canal that's never been published before. I'm not going to shunt that out of the way to get something in for a film no one likes. Or that they like for the wrong reasons. Uh, <laughs> they like for its yeah. unintentional hilarity. Um, but no, I think that was then the good approach because, um, I mean, this, like you say, this book is so full to the brim already with exciting new stuff that uh, I'm I'm okay with it not being uh, discussed. Um, so with, I mean, now that you have multiple books of this kind under your belt and you've gotten to explore a movie that you love so much, what uh, do you have coming up? Do you have any other books uh, that you're working on for for films like this? I have. So I've got my list, which I always circulate with the publisher. And they always look at it like, mm, didn't we say no last year? <laughs> um, and I was like, well, you said that before about other ones that sold really well. Um, I've been offered some books as well, which I'm, I'm not allowed to talk about, but um, uh, it, there are other ones coming. Absolutely. I wish I, I wish I was allowed to tell you because um, these are, these are, I don't own the publishing house. So I would tell you if it was up to me, but um, there are, there are at least three more coming for me and, and one that I'm starting. I've just sort of kicked off on in the last couple of days. Um, but, but similar things, you know, people want me to find out the real story of what really happened and, uh, and, and and it is tricky because the studios, Studio Canal have a great archive with, with this book. They helped enormously. But with some of my other books, it's been very hard getting decent photography, finding images that haven't been seen before. And uh, these will be ones that are not in the studio archive. So that's why they haven't been published. So that kind of detective work is, is kind of laborious, but very rewarding. Um, and, and it's always a challenge to say to someone, do you remember that film from years ago? Well, if you've already got the DVD and the Blu-ray and the 4K and this, that, and the other, now go and buy this big, heavy book. Because people think, well, what's going to be in that, that I haven't seen? And it's like, ah, we'll pay for it. There's no refunds. Um, and, and find out. I'm excited to see what you do next. Uh, and I I was admittedly not aware of your prior works uh, before this book. So I look forward to diving into those as well while I wait. So uh, but that is all the questions I really had, John. So thank you so much for taking the time for writing this book. I, I greatly appreciate it. No, my pleasure. And if you ever want me back to talk about any of these other books, then uh, you have but to ask. I will be sure to keep that in mind. Uh, I, I I mean, you know, Screen Rant, we have a rabid uh, movie TV fandom, so I'm sure they would be more than delighted to read about everything else.
Look, here's a question for you, Grant. Um, sure. And I've been asking people this and put some on the spot a bit. What film that hasn't had a movie book would you want me to write for you? So that is one that uh, I actually discussed with someone else recently who uh, did an oral history book that I interviewed, uh, and it would be Event Horizon. Uh, it's a movie that when I first saw it, I thought it was just OK. And then I've come to rewatch it since and have really come to appreciate what it went for. And I know how troubled that production was and, you know, stories of lost tapes, lost footage, this and that. And I just think it would be very intriguing to learn more about it, uh, especially since Paul W.S. Anderson loves talking about that movie. I feel like he would be he would give so much great insight for a book like that. Yeah, I think that's a really good pick, actually. Um, and I, I know the folks down at Paramount as well. So um, you never know that could happen. There you go. Maybe, maybe if that's not already on your list, maybe you add it in there and uh, and and keep it in mind for the future. I'll have to. Yeah, I mean, it's um, the fascinating thing is, you know, that would make a great book, and it's quite a visual treat as well. It's often, it is films that have been less successful or have less um, had less attention when they were first released are making the more interesting books. Definitely, definitely. I mean, uh, one I did an interview recently with uh, Max Every. He did a I don't know if you've seen it, but he did a whole making of oral history book on Dune, David Lynch. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And oh, that was such an incredible book. It's a big one. <laughs> so if you're going to read it, I I suggest uh, setting aside probably uh, a good chunk of time. But um, but again, that's that's a movie where, yeah, it has that cult following and it made for such a great read, much like this. So, yeah, I think uh, I, I agree with you. Um, movies that have more interesting behind the scenes stories than the movie itself uh end up being great reads excellent stuff well hopefully i'll be back with the next one i look forward to it have a great rest of your week john